Hit him, my little, hit him. Thank you for joining us for this sermon podcast from United Christian Church of Austin, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're invited and welcome. This sermon from Sunday, October 12th, 2014, is entitled, No Fast Faith. It's a reflection on a reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 32, verses 1 through 14. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to learn more about our open and affirming ministry at United Christian Church, head over to our website, www.uccaustin.org. Thank you. Our reading today comes from the Hebrew Scriptures, from the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, from the book of Exodus, chapter 32, verses 1 through 14. Let's listen for a word from God for us today. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it, in a mold and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And God changed God's mind about the disaster that God planned to bring on God's people. Friends, God is still speaking to the world. May our hearts be open to listen and respond. Amen. And God changed God's mind about the disaster that God planned to bring on God's people. You gotta love the Old Testament. Though, of course, not everyone really does. Some people, a lot of people actually, think the Old Testament and the God of the Old Testament is just too rough and tumble, too bloody-minded. From the very beginnings of the church, at least as early as Marcion in the second century, there have been those among us who wanted to cut our Christian faith off from our Jewish roots for just that reason. They wanted to concentrate 
we sometimes, very often in fact, want to concentrate on what we believe to be the simpler, sweeter God of the New Testament, the God of Jesus Christ. Never mind the fact that as a faithful Jew, Jesus' God is the God of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew Scriptures. Or that to call Jesus' God simple is simply oversimplifying. But I understand the impulse. There is an awful lot of smiting going on back there. But I'm not really sure that we can lay it all at God's door rather than our own historically proven bloody-mindedness. But I love the Old Testament. I love preaching from the Old Testament, particularly passages like this. Because passages like this often feel so much more alive, so much more living and breathing, so much more just kind of sweaty with humanity. More human, really, than some of the more philosophical abstractions we find elsewhere, say in the epistles or the poetic ramblings of Revelation. I may not like the people that I read about in these stories, but I sure recognize them all too well. And I recognize their theological imagination, too, the way they struggle to work out just who this living God is that they find themselves in relationship with and what this God wants from them. As people of faith, that's all we're really trying to do, isn't it? We feel in our bones that there's more going on out in the world than meets the eye. And we're trying to figure out what that more is and what it means for us in the way we live our lives. It can be frustrating, this faith stuff. In this passage, the Hebrew people have come through an incredible ordeal, the Exodus, their liberation from slavery in Egypt, accompanied by signs and wonders, plagues and pyrotechnics. Somehow, they even managed to cross the sea to escape Pharaoh's chariots and find freedom in the wilderness. But now they find themselves in the wilderness, breathing hard and wondering just what the heck happened back there and what in the world comes next. Hey Hebrews, you just left a life of slavery in Egypt, the only life you've ever known. What are you going to do next? Disney World? Actually, they say, we have no idea. Moses, Moses, he seemed to have some sort of idea, some sort of direction, but Moses went up on the mountain to commune with God. 37 days ago, he went up there. 38. 39. So far, nothing. We don't know when he's coming back or even if he will at all. We don't know whether he's alive or dead. For all we know, he could be lying in a ditch someplace by the roadside. And here we are. And as we all know, there's nothing nature or our human communities abhor more than a vacuum. Waiting. Sitting still. Spinning our wheels. No, we want to know, we want to know now. Or at least we want to pretend like we know. We, we want to be busy doing something, even if it's the wrong thing. And so in their frustration, the Hebrew people decide to do the most satisfying wrong thing they can think of. Rather than sit still and wait on Moses one minute more, rather than wait on God, the people instead call an emergency congregational meeting, and instruct their associate pastor, Aaron, to make them a god. Well, something vaguely god-shaped, god-ish. Behold, Aaron says, behold, here, O Israel, is your god. I know it looks a little smaller than you expected. <laughs> it's a matter of perspective, really. It it's, it's actually is smaller, but it's closer to you, so it looks bigger. Objects in the mirror and all that. 
if we're honest, we all know that feeling. That feeling that when you're anxious and wondering which way to turn and where to go, and you just want to get off the dime and do something, and you don't really care much what an idol in the hand sure feels worth more than a real god in the bush any day. <laughs> we just want to drive through, get our little bag of God, and move on. And here's the part of the story that I love so much. The impatient people at the foot of the mountain imagine for themselves an equally impatient God talking about them the very same way up at the top. Even as they're looking up in their frustration, they imagine God looking down, seeing them in their sin and confusion, and turning to Moses to say, Hey, buddy. What are you going to do about your people down there? Did you catch that? That small but important pronoun shift in the language of God there? Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, Moses, they have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way I commanded you. I'm tired of this stiff-necked stuff. I brought them up out of Egypt. Ten plagues. Ten. I made a way for them where there was no way. I parted the sea. I know it's hardly the Hyatt Regency out here in the wilderness, but still I have provided for them food and water and their every need along the way. And all I asked, God says, is that they wait here a little while to rest and retool for the journey ahead, to seek my will and my way, and they couldn't even give me 40 days. You know what? I'm done. That's it. I wipe my hands of the whole sorry bunch of them. I'm just going to wipe the slate clean and start over. Worked with Noah. <laughs> so how about it, Moses? How would you like to be the father of a great nation? How would you like to be the founding member of Second Congregational Church, Sinai? <laughs> funny. Painfully funny and familiar. And it may just be a theological fantasy, an argument from the absurd. Of course God's not like that, right? But you know who is? This guy. In this in-between place we inhabit at the base of the mountain. With any ultimate answer seemingly high up and far away, and the uncomfortably familiar but at least familiarly uncomfortable history just barely in the rearview mirror, it is tempting to look around for quick and popular fixes. Instead of waiting on the Lord, Doing the hard work of discerning the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect, we want instead what is expedient, what is immediately satisfying. In our frustration and our hunger, we'd rather have the happy meal than a real meal or even real happiness for that matter. And to be clear, I'm not using the familiar preacher's we here. You know that thing preachers do when we say we, but we really mean you out there in the pews. You know, like, folks, we really need to do something about the budget. <laughs> Truth is, I'm down here at the base of the mountain with the rest of you, waiting and wondering, wondering, you know, wondering just as a thought how much gold it would take to make ourselves, you know, just a little idol, something small and shiny, just enough to, you know, tide us over until God shows up. But of course, that's not even our problem just in the church, is it? We see the same forces, the same tensions and temptations at work in the world around us where too many leaders and too many peoples in way too many places, even the ones we like, seem all too eager to sacrifice the good for the expedient, for the electable. Racial reconciliation get real. Climate change? Not this election cycle. Peace? What, with these poll numbers? 
it's so tempting to give into impatience and the pressure to perform, to produce, so tempting to stray from what is the uncomfortably long moral arc of history, to put aside our lifelong, nay, generations long human search for the deep satisfaction of the good and the real and the true, and instead turn aside for the immediate appeal of the cheap and fast and shiny. But God changed God's mind about the disaster that God planned to bring on God's people. Fortunately for us, theological imaginings aside, God, the real God, the God we see in these scriptures, the God of Jesus, God doesn't play that. The God of the Jews, the God of Jesus, is a God instead of steadfast love that endures even our best, worst efforts to be faithful. Their God, our God, is a God who is patient and kind, who isn't envious or boastful or arrogant or rude, who isn't irritable or resentful, but bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, even us, and in turn calls us to practice patience and kindness, generosity, humility, meekness, civility, compassion, and respect, to, to bear all things, hope all things, and endure all things, even the waiting, and empowers us in time to do all this and more. For the sake of all that that God promises, we can wait. We can wait together here at the foot of the mountain, trusting God and one another. We can actively wait, actively trying to discern the will of God for us, the work that God would have us do. We can test it and try it and try it again. Lather, rinse, repeat. When it doesn't work out so well, we can try again and again to get closer to the goal that God shows us of a truly beloved and loving community and a world transformed. We can wait. We don't have to get it right, right away, which is good, because we won't. We don't have to have it all right now, which is good, because we can't. Because at the end of the day, it's not about being fast, but faithful. It's not about my way or your way, but whether in patience and trust and mutuality as a people of faith together, God's people, we can let the little idols go and commit ourselves again to God's way, here and now and there and then, as God is pleased to reveal unto us step by step by step by step, by step. Friends, if you've heard the word of God preached here today, remember to give all honor and glory to our one God, creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.